Everybody has heard of the city called Jerusalem, but few realize how important the events are that took place 20 centuries ago. Francois will now take us in the footsteps of the man that had the most significant influence in man's history. We will visit the place where Jesus was born, grew up, served, suffered and died. Listen to the good news as presented by Francois. When you visit the synagogue next to the Wailing Wall, this rabbi will tell you that he is a descendant of Abram and the rightful heir of the Holy Land. The Palestinians also claim Israel as their land through their forefather Ishmael, also the son of Abram, and the war between Ishmael and Isaac that began so many centuries ago is still raging and will continue until the end according to the book of Daniel. The name Jerusalem means peace, but there is no peace because of the hatred between Jew and Arab. But in spite of the political tension, Jerusalem is still one of the most fascinating cities in the world. I've walked these little lanes so many times by day and by night and they don't seem to lose their charm. There is something in Jerusalem that beckons you to come back. Come with me to the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem. This is the site, according to tradition, where Christ was born. Luke 2 verse 7 says this about Mary. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's proceed to the place where the manger used to be. Now whether this is the genuine birthplace of Christ does not really matter. What really matters is the fact that God became man. And this is the golden chain that binds us to Christ, and through Christ we are bound to God the Father. Archaeologists discovered this ancient manger at Megiddo, when the saviour of the world was born, he was placed in such a crude stone manger from where animals were fed. No smell of baby powder, only the stale smell of animals. What humility, what a sacrifice in order to come and identify with people like you and me. While you are looking at the ripened grain at the shepherd's field of Bethlehem, let me tell you what the name in Hebrew means. Bet means house and Lechem means bread. But Bethlehem produced more than just physical bread. It produced the bread of heaven. Jesus says in John 6 verse 35. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. I invite you to have a daily portion of this nourishing food. You will find it in the pages of the Bible. Let's do a little geography before visiting Nazareth. We are standing on the ancient tell of Megiddo. The hill on your right hand is Mount Gilboa where Saul committed suicide. The hill straight ahead of you is Mount Tabor, the Mount of Transfiguration. The town where Jesus grew up is on your left. Let's go there. A beautiful church has been erected over the caves where the poor people lived. The world's finest artists were employed to beautify this church and millions of dollars were used in its construction. But in sharp contrast to the luxury above are the humble cave dwellings below. This is where the world's redeemer grew up. What kind of character did he develop in these unfavorable circumstances? Luke 2 verse 40 says, And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. What a life for contemplation. When I drank water from the well from which Jesus drank, I thought of a statement that I once read. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb and a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. This comes from the book The Desire of Ages, page 28. When a modern Jewish boy turns 13, he is taken to the Western Wall in Jerusalem where he celebrates his Bar Mitzvah. At the age of 12, Jesus attended his first Passover feast in Jerusalem. It was at this time he shared his divine insights of the Holy Scriptures 
with the scribes. This scale model of the temple gives you an idea of what Jesus saw. One Bible commentator said that while Jesus was watching the impressive rites of the Paschal service, he began to realize his mission as the saviour of the world. I took this picture from one of the hills of Nazareth overlooking the valley of Jezreel. Luke 2 verse 52 records the following words after Jesus and his parents returned home from Jerusalem. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. He was the best and the most honest carpenter in Nazareth. I wonder if he didn't make his own cross. The river Jordan is mentioned in many Old Testament stories, but this river really became important when Jesus was baptised here at the age of 30 by John the Baptist. After his baptism, Jesus was led into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. The only weapon he used in his fight against the enemy was quoting scriptures. When I looked at this monastery at Jericho, commemorating the 40-day wilderness experience of Jesus, I thought of the importance of Bible study. If Jesus made use of the Bible to gain the victory over the tempter, how much more should you and I make use of this mighty sword to defeat the enemy? Don't you think this is beautiful? I took this photo just below the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus left Judea, he came to Galilee where he spent most of his time ministering to the needs of people. It's quite an experience to walk in his footsteps and see names like Magdala, which reminds one of Mary Magdalene, the lady that used to live here. Jesus changed her from a failure to an overcomer. This is the place, according to some Bible scholars, where Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount. Can you hear his words of comfort rolling down these beautiful hills early one spring morning? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, happy is the person who feels his need of God. I'm so glad that we don't have to qualify with our deeds, but rather with our needs. We're looking at the Mount of Blessings from a boat on the Sea of Galilee. Two thousand years ago, people sat over there while listening to Jesus saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is more than just mourning the loss of a loved one. It is a deep sorrow for transgressing God's holy law. And only the Holy Spirit can produce this kind of sorrow in our hearts. Let's take a boat and sail towards the ruins of the ancient town called Kafarnaum, the city of Nahum. Today it's called Capernaum. Archaeologists discovered the original synagogue where Jesus preached just behind this second century one. One Sabbath while Jesus was preaching, a man with an evil spirit walked in here. Mark 1.26 tells us that Jesus healed him. And Jesus who healed people so long ago is still the same healer today. It's a great experience to sleep at Tiberias and greet the sun as it rises over the Sea of Galilee. One morning as I watched the fishing boats coming in after a night of fishing, I thought of Jesus, the God-man who changed the history of this world. He mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for everyone he met. He ministered to their needs. He wept with those who wept and he rejoiced with those who were happy. As I meditated on the life of Christ, I asked God to help me to be a little more considerate, to make me a little kinder and a little more forgiving. You are looking at the modern city of Tiberias, which is also mentioned in John chapter 6, verse 23. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Usually the waters of the lake are calm and placid as you can see. But storms, without a moment's warning, can turn this lake into a turmoil. Listen to this interesting incident from Matthew 8 verse 23. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without a warning, a furious storm came upon the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. 
The rest of the story says the disciples were so absorbed in their efforts to save themselves that they forgot that Jesus was on board. As you look over the sea of your own experiences, are you facing a terrible storm right now? Are you sinking in despair? Are you overcome by feelings of guilt and remorse? Then I would advise you to do what the disciples did, Matthew 8.25. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. How did he respond to their desperate cry for help? You know, I love these Bible stories. Never did a soul utter that cry and heed it. As the disciples grasp their oars to make a last effort, Jesus rises. He stands in the midst of his disciples while the tempest rages. The waves break over them and the lightning illuminates his countenance. He lifts his hand, so often employed in deeds of mercy, and says to the angry sea, Peace, be still. The storm ceases. The billows sink to rest. The clouds roll away and the stars shine forth. The boat rests upon a quiet sea. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus asks sorrowfully, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? The story of Jesus and his disciples on the stormy sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago appeals to every human heart inviting us to allow Jesus to calm our troubled hearts. Excavations done at Tiberias agree with what the Bible says about this coastal city. The reason why the name is only mentioned twice in the New Testament is very interesting. Herod Antipas built a city on the site of an old cemetery and the better-class Jew considered Tiberias ceremonially unclean. Because of a recent drought, the water level of the Sea of Galilee dropped tremendously. Someone then noticed an object in the mud. After excavating the area, they found a very ancient boat, and to the pleasant surprise of all, he dated from the time of Christ. Did he sail in this boat? I don't think this discovery was incidental. I think it was providential. Let's leave the peaceful scenes of Upper Galilee and return to Jerusalem for the last few minutes of our lecture. In the story of the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible speaks of a stone that was rolled away from his tomb. Here you see a typical example of such a stone at the family grave of Herod the Great. We are standing in the Kotel Tunnel in Jerusalem. This young Israeli guide is telling us about the former glory of this famous city. I took this slide of the Damascus Gate in 1966 during my very first visit to Jerusalem. In those days, the city was under total Palestinian rule. For many years, scholars maintained that the original Damascus Gate was situated just below the modern gate. But because Arabs occupy this part of the city, they were not allowed to excavate. But fortunately, this part of the city developed a sewage problem in the early 80s and they were forced to dig around the Damascus Gate. And guess what? They discovered the original Damascus Gate from the time of Christ. What an archaeological breakthrough. Christ and his disciples walked on these very stones you see. I told these friends of mine that the story of Jesus and his ministry in Jerusalem is a true story. As a matter of fact, it is the greatest story ever told. And believing that story means eternal life. Archaeologists also discovered and identified the Pool of Siloam. This is where a certain blind man washed his eyes at Jesus' command and received his sight. This is what Jesus did for people when he was here. The same Jesus wants to heal my blindness concerning the needs of those around me. Have you ever had an experience where an accident turned out to be a blessing? We were on our way to the Mount of Olives when the Arabs threw stones at our bus. And then we were told to report this attack to the police. While I was waiting for the paperwork to be completed, I strolled around and came across this huge column. 
To my pleasant surprise, I discovered that it dated from the time of the second temple, that means from the time when Christ was on this earth. What a discovery! It gives one an idea of the former glory of that beautiful temple. By the way, when you visit Jerusalem and you notice these flat rims around the building blocks, remember they are identifying marks of the masonry of the second temple, the temple from the time of Christ. I have exciting news for you. They have also discovered the sarcophagus of Caiaphas, the high priest who reigned during the time of Christ. He was involved in the condemnation of Christ. Jesus was betrayed by one of his best friends, a man by the name of Judas, and then arrested in Gethsemane on a Thursday evening just after midnight. Botanists tell us that these olive trees are the children of the trees who grew here when Jesus was agonizing for us. It was here that he decided to take the crushing weight of our sins upon himself. He knew that by owning our guilt, he would be separated from his father. Jesus was in such agony that his capillaries burst and his face was covered in blood. This only happened five times in medical history and every time the person died. What love, what incomprehensible love for a sinner like you and me. After his arrest in Gethsemane, he was led through the Kidron Valley and up these very steps to the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest. A mocking crowd of almost a thousand people surrounded him. Can you see him? If this recent excavation at St. Peter's in Galigantu could talk, you would hear the story of how Jesus was struck with cruel fists, spat in the face and mocked till daybreak. First he was tried before Annas, then before both Annas and Caiaphas. After that, the Sanhedrin tried and condemned him in an illegal nighttime trial. Then at sunrise his trial was reenacted. Four unfair trials to condemn the innocent Christ. Can you perhaps identify with him? Archaeologists discovered these grooves in the rock at the palace of the high priest. Whenever a person was found guilty, his hands were tied in here. Then he received a total of 26 lashes across his chest, which ripped out his flesh. One of the Messianic Psalms predicted that Jesus would be cast into a dungeon. Let me read from Psalms 88 verse 7. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. I'm reading from verse 8 while you are looking up at the actual opening of the dungeon where Jesus was locked up. You have taken me from my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I'm confined and cannot escape. Mark 15 verses 1 and 2 Very early in the morning the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away and turned him over to Pilate. Was there really such a Roman governor in Jerusalem at this time as the Bible states? While excavating at the ancient Roman amphitheater at Caesarea, archaeologists came across this cornerstone. On investigation they concluded that it was an altar dedicated to Caesar Tiberius. I wish I could have shared my deepest emotions with you when I first saw the name Pontius Pilate outside the Bible. There was really a man by this name, and there was really a God-man called Jesus Christ who was condemned to death by this Roman governor. This chapel along the Via della Rosa is called Echo Homo, Latin for Behold the Man. It commemorates the time when Pilate contrasted Jesus with Barabbas. He said, Behold the man. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. According to the Gospel of John, Pilate acquitted Jesus three times. He could not believe that they would choose Barabbas, a known criminal, over the gentle and kind Jesus. So in order to solicit the sympathy of the crowd, he had Jesus flogged forty lashes save one, and then presented him with these words, Behold the man. Many interesting discoveries were made in the area of the ancient fortress of Antonio where the Roman guard was stationed. 
This, for instance, is the original pavement called Lithos Stratos, where Jesus was condemned to death. While the cruel, unfair trial was in progress, the soldiers played the game of the kings on this pavement. Matthew 27, 16 says, Pilate had Jesus flogged. Ancient sources tell us that this was so severe that many a victim died before the last few lashes were administered. The victim was stripped to the waist, usually bound to a post with his hands tied together and then lacerated on his back. But let me tell you more about the cruel Roman instrument of torture, the flagellum, which was used to administer the forty lashes save one. Pieces of bone and metal were tied to the thongs to intensify the suffering. I don't think it's necessary for me to tell you exactly what the victim looked like when the last few lashes ripped up the remaining flesh. Oftentimes the victim's intestines were exposed and he died before they could crucify him. We are bought with a very expensive price, the life of Jesus Christ. It was Roman custom to flog the condemned before crucifixion, so Jesus received a second flogging of 40 lashes save one. This gives us a total of 78 lashes on his back by the Roman authorities. Add another 26 lashes on his chest administered by the Jews. You get 140 lashes in total. Just one big wound. Unrecognizable. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, the original only says wound, you have been healed. John 19 verses 17 and 18 says that Jesus was crucified at a place called the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. General Gordon was the first to identify this skull-like hill. For many years I had the desire to visit this hill called Calvary. And then one specific year I found that the gate that guarded Calvary was not locked and the man who guarded the area was gone. I quickly slipped in and took this picture. As you notice, Calvary today is a Muslim cemetery and no Westerner is allowed to come in and take pictures here. This is the place where, according to some scholars, the greatest event of all history took place. It was here that God the Father and God the Son settled our sin account and revealed their supreme love for us. While I stood here, Galatians 3.13 came to my mind. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one who is hung on a tree. What is the curse of God? The Bible says it is eternal separation from him. Why was Christ cursed with a curse of an eternal separation from the Father? Because he took my sins upon himself, so that I may take his righteousness upon myself. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 says, In Adam all die. When Adam, our representative, chose to sin, we all sinned in him. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. How was God going to satisfy the claims of the law on the one hand, as well as setting the sinner free on the other hand? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. On Calvary, Jesus died as the representative of fallen humanity. In Christ, we have already received the punishment for our sins, which is eternal death. When Jesus died, the claims of the law were fully satisfied. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does Paul mean when he says he was crucified with Christ? Was he nailed onto one of the other crosses? No. Paul says that when Christ died, he, Paul, also died. He received the punishment of eternal death, eternal separation from God when Christ was punished. 
My fellow sinner, we have already received the punishment for transgressing God's law. We are set free. Let's thank God for it. When I took the picture of this lonely tree on Calvary, I thought of the lonely cross that stood here 2,000 years ago. You know, Jesus was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death that was ours, that we might receive the life that was his. Isaiah 53 verse 5 He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. May I invite you to trust God fully to handle your sin problem. He is more than capable. Maybe you have a little doubt as to whether you will make it to heaven one day. May I invite you to trust him to get you there. While you're looking at the traditional tomb where Christ was buried, I would remind you of Paul's words in Colossians 3 verse 1. You have been raised with Christ. What a thought. When Jesus was resurrected that Sunday morning, we too were resurrected in him. And what happened when Jesus ascended to heaven from this traditional spot on the Mount of Olives? Well, he took us with him to heaven. Somewhere beyond a million galaxies, we have a mediator, a representative called Jesus Christ. Right now, by faith, we are sitting with him in heavenly places. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He longs to apply the benefits of his atonement for those who ask for it. Just grab it, receive it, accept it. Isaac Watts is one of my favourite hymn writers. I took this slide in Bunhill Field Cemetery in London where he was buried. I love to read his songs, especially this specific one. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a tribute far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Another beautiful hymn says, Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labours of my hands can fulfil thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. Are you guilt-ridden, longing for peace that surpasses all human understanding? Do you want the assurance of salvation? It is so very simple. All you have to do is to bring your sins and your failures to the foot of the cross, confess them and leave them there. The moment you do it, God rewrites your history of failure into the history of his Son, and you are saved by grace. This is the very, very, very good news. My prayer is that you will accept this divine offer. The acceptance thereof means eternal life. Thank you, Francois, for bringing to life the history of Jerusalem in a meaningful way. Heavenly Father, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Thank you for the greatest gift of all times, Jesus Christ, who has brought to us hope in this hopeless world. Bless everyone who listens to the good news of the gospel. Amen.